Section 24 of Pantrophian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eleanor in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Pantrophian by Alexis Sawyer. Section 24. The Cook. The author of a rare and very curious work, which no one at present has time to read, formed the charitable project of reconciling medicine and gastronomy. This was a noble enterprise, worthy of a true philanthropist, and which assuredly presented less difficulties than people may think. In effect, what was the moot question? To agree de forma without interfering with the substance— to examine whether culinary preparations poison, as has been said, the food which nature gives us, and unceasingly paralyze the salutary action of the dietetic which the faculty describe. For many centuries, cooking has been exposed to these odious reproaches, the gravity of which we do not pretend to attenuate, and yet, ever pursuing its brilliant career amidst revolutions and ruins, the magiric art, endowed with internal youth, embellishes each new era of civilization, receives its most constant homage, and survives it when it fades away. Let us speak plainly. Mankind has thrown on cooks all the faults of which they ought to accuse their own intemperance. It was no doubt easier than to avoid the fatal abuse of pleasure and the evils it brings with it, but there was the crying injustice, which we do not hesitate to denounce. There lay the obstacle it was necessary to overcome in order to bring about a peaceful understanding between the disciples of Galen and the followers of Apicius. Gormandies would never have rebelled against the kitchen if all polyphagists had obtained from the good Ceres the gift she granted to Pandaria, a celebrated eater, who could pass days and nights at table without experiencing the slightest indigestion. But, say you, Seneca, the philosopher, perpetually combats with the authority of his virtuous language those dangerous men who are busied with a single stomach, and who lay the foundation for a train of maladies. To reply to this is that Seneca, the pedant, should have thundered against the stomach, which alone is guilty, he has sometimes done so, that this atrabilarious preceptor of Nero, attacked with an incurable consumption, could only eat very little, which much enraged him and that his imprecations on the subject of the excessive riches and prodigious luxury of the Romans of his age neither hindered him from possessing and unceasingly increasing a more than royal fortune, nor from feeding, well or ill, several thousand slaves, nor from pompously displaying in his palace five hundred tables, only five hundred of the most elaborate workmanship of the rarest wood, all alike and ornamented with precious incrustations. How often have people extolled the Lacedaemonians and their legislator Lycurgus? Well, Lycurgus mercilessly commanded poor little children to fast when they looked fresh and fat. Strange lawgiver of a strange people, who never learned to eat, and yet who invented the celebrated black sauce, the jus nigrum, for which the entrails of the hair served as the foundation. So true it is that cookery always preserves certain imprescriptible rights over the most fervent disciples of frugality. Moralists do not cease to repeat that Rome would never have had sumptuary laws had it not been corrupted by cooks from Athens and Syracuse. This is an error. All the ordinances of the consuls proscribe profusion, excess in a word, all the ruinous expenses of a passionate and ridiculous gastrovachy at the same time respecting the magiric art itself. That is to say, that industrious chemistry which composes, decomposes, combines, and mixes, in a word, prepares different substances which gluttony, delicacy, the fashion, or luxury may confide to it for the space of a few minutes. Why render the cook responsible for the extravagant tastes and follies of his age? Is it for him to reform mankind? Has he either the means or the right? What is asked of him, and what can be asked? To understand exactly the properties of everything he employs, to perfect and correct, if necessary, the savors on which he operates, to judge a true taste, to destitute with a delicate palate, 
to join the skillful address of the hand and the prompt and comprehensive glance to the bold but profound conceptions of the brain and above all it cannot be too often repeated to identify himself so well with the habits the wants even the caprices and gastronomic eccentricities of those whose existence he embellishes that he may be able not to obey them but to guess them and even have a presentiment of them such is to use an original expression of verbalius toutes l'artère de gueule which the cook can master it is the sum total of what has been bequeathed to us by some great men whose scattered instructions lying here and there in books of morality and philosophy there are numerous analogies between the act of eating and the art of living well have been collected with scrupulous care classed with all the attention we can command and will serve we hope to beguile the studious leisure of the lovers of antiquity and the culinary science mankind had long obeyed that imperious and periodical necessity which has been called hunger when it announces its presence with its brutal exigencies before any one thought to form a code of doctrine calculated to guide a sensation which by its energy and duration procures us the most thrilling and lasting pleasures the primitive nations no doubt gave themselves up to their native gluttony they eat much but they fed badly they did not yet possess gastronomy and consequently they had no cooks in the serious and complete acceptation of the word the heroes of homer prepared their repasts with their own hands and what repasts god is of taste and prided themselves on their culinary talents ou la vanité va t elle se ulysses surpassed all others in the art of lighting the fire and laying the cloth patroclus drew the wine and achilles very carefully turned the spit the conquerors of troy shone more in combat than under the tent which served them as a kitchen at length the aurora of the magiric ages began to dawn it is not a revolution it is a creation which is preparing to appear man has only known hunger he shall now become acquainted with the charms of an appetite the king of sidon learns how to eat and it is cadmus that the grandfather of bacchus the future founder of thebes who takes upon himself to instruct this august mouth and since that time how many illustrious followers have descended into the arena how many glorious names will not culinary annals have to register somebody will perhaps one day publish a chronological history of celebrated cooks in the meantime it may not be amiss to recall to memory a few illustrious men whose services and genius an ungrateful posterity has too soon forgotten thimbron among the greeks took the culinary art from its cradle he watched devoutedly over its development and only descended into the tomb after having won the heart of the whole of greece for his favorite science timachidus of rhodes cook and poet of the highest renown composed an epopee on the art which he professed in the midst of emanations from the stoves and the spit his verses glowing with the sacred fire which inspired him lighted up the magiric vein of several of his disciples among whom numenius hegemon and metrius are still cited artemidorius collected and commented on all the words in use in the kitchens of his time greece owed to this patient terminologist the possession of a culinary language subject to certain unchangeable rules mythicus gave the sicilian cook a remarkable type of multitude of tiresome and insipid imitations at length archistratus appeared he was of syracuse and passed all his life in profoundly meditating on the functions strength anomalies and resources of the stomach he discovered the laws which govern that organ and presented to the world his magnificent treatise on gastronomy an inestimable masterpiece of laborious investigation of which time has deprived us together with the works of his useful predecessors we must not omit the names of some celebrated theoricians to whom the art owes its rapid progress philoxenus of lucatus devoted himself to the difficult study of degustation and practiced several experiments which were however ill appreciated by his contemporaries thus in the public baths he accustomed his mouth and hands to the contact of boiling water in order to be able to seize and devour burning viands the instant they were placed on the table he recommended cooks to serve everything very hot 
so that he alone exercised mastication and deglutition while other guests less injured were obliged to content themselves with looking at him pythalus invented a sheath that covered the tongue and protected it without paralyzing its action against a caloric dangerous to its delicate tissue this ingenious cuirass was not appreciated and history in its thoughtlessness has not even transmitted to us a description of it it was then the good time of athens gluttons had made way for epicureans hunger to a less fierce and gross sensation already subjected to examination and discussion the magiric art possessed its rules its various partisans its professors and disciples great masters studied deeply the appetite indispensable basis on which will always rest the culinary exegesis and they finished by classing it definitively according to the three degrees of intensity which observation discovers in it the bold appetite said they is that which is felt when fasting it reflects but very little it is not squeamish about viands and loses all reserve at the sight of a very indifferent ragout the indolent appetite requires to be encouraged it must be enticed pressed irritated at first nothing moves it but after having tasted a succulent dish it rouses is astonished its ardour becomes animated and is capable of performing prodigies it is this appetite which has consecrated the trivial but true proverb l'appetit vient en mangeant the eclectic appetite owes nothing to nature it is the child of art happy thrice happy the skilful cook to whom it says thou art my father but how difficult is this creation how rare it is the work of genius but listen some guests chosen amidst veteran epicureans seat themselves round a table covered with culinary offerings worthy only of the god of feasts and a small number of the faithful their indolent appetite examines compares judges and at length abandoned itself to the incomparable dainties from which it unceasingly seems to draw new ardour but alas pleasure like pain has its limits here below strength grows less and becomes extinguished the eye loses its greedy covetousness the palate languishes the tongue becomes paralyzed the stomach sinks and that which before pleased now creates only fatigue and disgust it is then that a cuisiner or ling tries a bold diversion which must never be risked if the artist does not feel in himself that force of generous efforts which is no other than genius by his orders three or four dishes prodigies of science and of luxury appear on the altar which the sacrificers no longer heed at this sight their looks brighten desire revives the smile reappears the magiric faces shine forth with all its splendor the chest dilates and you no longer distinguish your former guests a man has transformed them each one chooses tries tastes is silent and lost in wonder the appetite is perhaps tired but not satiated and the skilful cook at length enjoys a deserved triumph in this solemn moment he received among the ancients a crown of flowers sweet and noble recompense of his arduous toil nay a more substantial proof of gratitude often greeted his new dishes in greece the inventor alone had a right to prepare them during a whole year and drew from it all the honor and profit it was necessary in order that these culinary preparations should fall into the public domain that some one of his colleagues should succeed in surpassing him at this epoch the best cooks came from sicily trimalcio was one of the most celebrated athenius tells us that when he could not procure rare and highly esteemed fish he understood so well how to imitate their form and flavor with common fish that the most cunning epicures were always entrapped this reminds us of a certain cook of louis the fourteenth who on good friday served the king with a dinner apparently composed of poultry and butcher's meat which in reality offered nothing but vegetables and prepared to omeg the romans inheritors of the luxury of asia and greece did not erect a temple to the greedy adiphasia goddess of good cheer who possessed altars in sicily but they thought it impossible to repay too highly those who knew how to extend the limits of the pleasures of the table and a generous senator offered his chef at least four talents or more than eight hundred pounds a year 
This is yet but little compared with the magnificence of Antony. He gave a supper to Cleopatra. That princess praised the delicacy of the feast, and immediately her lover called for the cook and presented him with a city in recompense. How times are changed. We, at the present day, treat all this as pompous and ridiculous prodigality. It is because our somewhat mean epoch judges the olden times by the narrow ideas of order, foresight, and economy. The ancients enriched their archimagiri, wasted their revenue in feasts, and then killed themselves. We have adopted a very different style of living. But at the same time, how far are our most sumptuous banquets behind the most modest collations of Greece and Rome? Lucullus caused to be served to Cicero and Pompey a little ambigu, which cost 1,000 pounds. They were only three of them to partake of it. The emperor Claudius had generally 600 guests at his table. Vitellius did not spend less than 3,200 pounds for each of his repasts, and the composition of his favorite dishes required that vessels should unceasingly ply between the Gulf of Venice and the Straits of Cadiz. It must be confessed that cooks of that gastronomic era had to fulfill an incessant and most laborious task. What was then more natural than to abandon to them some thousands of those cesters, which the profusion of the master devoured by millions in the form of phenicopter's tongues, scaris or parrotfish's livers, and peacock's brains. We see that the Caesars encouraged this frightful gastronomic monomania. Tiberius gave more than three thousand pounds to the author of a dialogue in which the interlocutors were mushrooms, fig peckers, oysters, and thrushes. Galba breakfasted before daybreak, and the breakfast would have enriched a hundred families. Elias Verus invented the pentapharmacum, a kind of macedoine composed of sow's flanks, pheasants, peacocks, ham, and wild boar's flesh. Geta insisted upon having as many courses as there were letters in the alphabet, and each of these courses must contain all the viands whose name began by the same letter. These follies, which cooks were forced to obey, continued to astonish the world until the moment when Rome, with her gods, the monuments of her ancient glory, and of her recent turpitudes, crumbled beneath the invincible weight of that horde of barbarians, that mysterious and implacable scourge, which divine vengeance reserved for the punishment of unheard-of crimes. But, as we have before remarked, the Magyaric art always survives revolutions and ruin of empires. Modern Italy inherited the wrecks of Roman cookery, and thanks to her, Europe is at the present day acquainted with the delights of good cheer and the charm of joyous repasts. Under the reign of Louis the Twelfth, there arose a company of sauce manufacturers who obtained the exclusive privilege of making sauces. Their statutes, 1394, inform us that the famous sauce a la cameline, sold by them, was to be composed of good cinnamon, good ginger, good cloves, good grains of paradise, good bread, and good vinegar. The sauce, tenths, was to be made of good sound almonds, good ginger, good wine, and good verjuice. We find in Taliviant, the celebrated cook of Charles V and Charles VI, besides the cameline, lo benite, holy water, the sauce for pike, la sapiquette, la mostachan, la gelatine, la sauce a la os, al mout, that of milk garlic, cold red and green sauces, sauce robert, potivine, a madame rapé, and a la dodine. Platina, a Latin author of the 15th century, speaks of other sauces, in the composition of which sugar was frequently employed, according to the proverb of those times, sugar never spoiled sauce. In the Middle Ages, poultry, butcher's meat, and roast game were never eaten dry, as they are now, any more than fried fish. There were different sauces for all those dishes, and even for the different parts of each animal, the cooks of those days strove to acquire a reputation by inventing strange and grotesque sauces, which had no other merit than that of being surprising and difficult to make, as, for example, eggs cooked on the spit, butter fried or roasted, etc. We recognize in some of our most common ragouts those of which our ancestors were so fond in the Middle Ages, such as the bouffe à la mode, à la persiade, au vinaigre et persil, Le Miroton de Boeuf, Vaux Perce de Grosse Lard, Fricassee de Poulet, Blanquette de Vaux Roti, but we have lost the potpourri, composed of beef, veal, mutton, bacon, and vegetables, and the gamula free, 
kind of a fricassee of fowl, seasoned with wine, verjuice, and spices, and thickened with the famous sauce cameline. The cooks frequently placed on their master's tables ragouts and other dishes borrowed from foreign nations. They had a German brouet, a Flemish chaudeau, eggs a la Florentine, and partridges a la Catalan. They knew the a la, a mixture of all sorts of vegetables cooked with different kinds of meats, which we owe to the Spaniards, as well as the ragout of fowl, called a la chipolata, and the kinefs, a kind of forced meatballs made of bread and meat, to which the Germans are very partial and the pilau, a dish of mutton, fowl, and rice borrowed from the Turks. The art of cooking, with its innumerable paraphernalia of sauces, with gravy, pepper, cinnamon, garlic, scallion, brains, with its gravy, soups, milk pottage, and ragouts, had a signal triumph at the wedding of Charles the Sixth of France. On that occasion, a skillful cook covered the great black marble table of the royal palace with a hundred dishes prepared in a hundred different ways. The good physicians did not prescribe the art of cooking. Several of their number even deigned to write treatises upon it. A certain monkish servant, moved by an indiscreet zeal, wished not only to mortify himself but all the Franciscans of the monastery. Consequently, he prepared the repast in the worst manner he could, but the community held a chapter, and he was condemned to receive fifty lashes. Many of the monks wanted to enforce a more rigorous discipline by giving a hundred. In the Middle Ages, the cook of a house of any note always seated himself in a high armchair to give his orders. He held a long wooden spoon in his hand, with which he tasted, without quitting his place, the various dishes that were cooking on the stoves and in the saucepans, and which served him also as a weapon with which to chastise the idle and gluttonous. The Kitchen Let us enter together one of those vast kitchens where two thousand years ago the marvelous suppers of some rich senator were concocted. In every direction, slaves are coming loaded with meat, game, sea fish, vegetables, fruit, and those expensive delicacies of which the dessert of the Romans was principally composed. The slaves have been over the principal markets of the city, especially those of the Trigamina Gate, of the Metasudante, of the Suburb Way, and the Sacred Way. Each one lays his basket at the feet of the procurator, or major domo, who examines the contents and registers them on his tablets. Then he is placed in the pantry, contiguous to the dining room, those of the provisions which demand no preparation, but whose graceful and symmetrical arrangement is confided by two aeolian servants designated under the name of structuris. All these porters are under the immediate orders of a confidential servant, obsonator, charged with buying the provisions necessary for the household, and who is obliged to make himself acquainted with the taste of his master and also of each guest, that he may procure nothing which they dislike. The remaining comestibles are placed in an airy and spacious apartment adjoining the kitchen, and at the back of the house. There, around a table loaded with numerous wooden figures representing a variety of animals, some attentive young men are practicing under the direction of an experienced master the difficult art of carving game and poultry, whilst a melodious symphony accustoms their skillful hands to hasten or retard their graceful movements according to the time of the music. In this learned rehearsal, the eye and ear, alike charmed, pass alternatively from the peaceful emotions of the pensive adagio to the lively cadences of the rapid allegro, and from the harmonious and calm andante to the captivating and joyous accents of a frenzied prestissimo. In this spacious laboratory, the most delicious emanations invite us. The chief of the cooks, the Archimagirius, Seated on a raised platform, embraces at a single glance the series of stock-pots and brick stoves, very similar to those in use at the present day, at which the silent crowd of assistants, ministers of his will, elaborate and watch the expensive dishes destined to form a splendid supper. As, at the moment of battle, the general, motionless on the height which commands a view of his army, hastens, orders, scolds his scattered battalions, absent and yet everywhere, animated with his own inspiration the warlike masses and exciting them with the excitement of his own soul he invokes victory and victory replies behold me the archimagirus has also his days of triumph and in the evening perhaps the king of the feast will place on his head a crown of flowers precious recompense of his talent and success at some distance from the culinary autocrat on the opposite side an immense iron grate 
carefully supplied with wood which an unhappy slave unceasingly blows with his breath into a flame throws around its lurid glare the lars grotesque figures roughly carved in stone protect the spot a cock is sacrificed to them in the month of december some learned men have supposed that the greeks and romans had no chimneys it is however easy to prove the contrary philocleo a character in the comedy of the wasps of aristophanes hides himself in a chimney a slave who hears him cries out what a noise there is in the pipe of this chimney philocleo being discovered exclaims i am the smoke and i am trying to escape appian speaking of the proscriptions of the triumvirs relates that several citizens fled into the pipes of the chimneys these two examples will preclude the necessity of more ample citations a vast cauldron of brass from argos or dodona placed on a tripod above the fireplace furnishes the hot water required for the service of the kitchen the frying pan beside it serves in the cooking of certain delicate cakes or fish the magiric laboratory to which the reader is invited is very nicely decorated with a profusion of utensils similar in every respect to our own in point of shape such as gridirons colanders dripping pans and tart dishes these objects are of tolerably thick bronze plated with fine silver charming shells of the same metal serve to mould the pastry which is afterwards disposed with order on the shelves of a country oven or in the upper part of the othpisa a kind of saucepan of corinthian brass of considerable value and made with such art that its contents cook instantly and almost without fire this simple and ingenious vessel possesses a double bottom the uppermost one holds the light delicacies destined for the dessert and the fire is underneath the diploma or double vase which has sometimes been confounded with the authepisa does not in the least resemble the latter it is thus they named the vessel called by us a bon marie the ancients made great use of this mild and gentle process of cooking which is often mentioned in the treatise of apicius these brass boilers which boil on the hearth supported by three feet are precisely like those used by the french at the present day boilers also of a rather different kind are sometimes used in which the operation of ebullition takes place sooner than in the first mentioned they are closed with a cover in the form of a dome and a large hollow cylinder fixed beneath hastens and keeps up the action of the caloric the saucepans around which a host of cooks are busily engaged are for the greater part made of brass or earthenware tolerably wide and deep which they place on the stoves and in which are concocted the delicate and scientific preparations some are of silver the caprices of luxury have led them to suppose that certain expensive viands acquire greater perfection when cooked in this precious metal a confidential slave charged with the care of the plate is cleaning and polishing near a dresser of large number of bronze chafing dishes which are to be used at table to prevent the plates from becoming cold it is in speaking of this useful invention that seneca the philosopher says daintiness gave birth to this invention in order that no viand should be chilled and that everything should be hot enough to please the most pampered palate the kitchen follows the supper each of these elegant utensils is supported by three geese it measures about seven inches from the extremity of one of the bird's heads to the opposite edge of the circumference this kind of tray is fifteen lines or an inch and a quarter deep and the feet raise it about two inches above the plane the three geese have their wings spread and terminate by neat's feet the heads raised on the breasts form graceful handles these chafing dishes arranged systematically on the sigma produce a delightful effect dishes of massive silver occupy another compartment of the vast cupboard an opulent family could not possibly do without this luxury Scylla had some which weighed two hundred marks and rome would produce more than five hundred of the same weight it was in fact a perfect furor which afterwards greatly augmented in the time of the emperor claudius one of his slaves named drusillinus rotundus possessed a silver dish weighing one thousand marks which was served in the midst of eight smaller ones weighing one hundred marks each these nine dishes were arranged at table on a machine which supported and placed them prominently in view the patina such was the name of these magnificent pieces of plate served for ragouts and fish the catinus an immense vase of earthenware among the poor and of silver which with the rich 
is more especially reserved for liquid dishes with much gravy and what we call pottage. Those silver cups and saucers of the same shape and size as those we employ for tea have a destination very strange to our ideas. They are used to drink hot water. They are worked in relief with a taste and delicacy which we cannot too much admire. The Roman spoons, rather different from our own, end on one side by a point to pick shellfish from their shell, and at the other by the bowl of a spoon with which eggs were eaten. Doubtless, forks were unknown to the Greeks, since Athenius relates that Pithilus, surnamed the dainty, did not content himself with covering his tongue with a species of net to appreciate the taste of the various dishes, but cleaned and rubbed it with a fish. He also enveloped his hands in a kind of glove to eat everything burning hot, a useless precaution if he had used a fork. This indispensable addition to a modern table was perhaps not common at Rome, but nevertheless it was to be seen at the residence of some wealthy families. The slave before mentioned holds several in his hand. These forks are remarkable for the beauty of their workmanship. The stag's feet, which terminate the handles, and the fillets with which they are ornamented, bear witness by their execution to the rare talent of the goldsmith. They are five inches and a half in length, and have only two prongs. Other servants dispose the earthenware pails in which the wine is to be placed to cool, and to prepare the drinking cups and crystal flagons. One of them replenishes with vinegar, salt, and pepper little vases designed by the name of acebillum, vinegar cruet. These are so many models of the most exquisite elegance in bronze, silver, and sometimes gold. They are manufactured simply of earthenware for the use of the middle class of people. The knives, destined to serve at table, are of brilliant steel and carefully sharpened. They bear each on the handle some whimsical ornament, and seem to have served as models for those which were so much in fashion toward the beginning of the 17th century, and which were called Chinese knives. The most precious plate is arranged before the arrival of the guests on the abacus, or sideboard, which decorates the dining room. This splendid piece of furniture, which will be noticed hereafter, was introduced into Rome 180 years B.C. It was also called the Delphic Table. However, the Archimagirus has drawn up a list of the repast, which contains the bill of fare of the dishes, and which, both in Greece and Rome, was always presented to the guests. He descends from his platform and goes to cast an inspiring glance on the work of each subordinate. Nothing escapes his learned investigation, from the peacock's eggs of the first service to the soft cheese commonly eaten at the third. Above all, he examines with minute attention the ovens, at which preside those second cooks of whose talents he is not certain, and who belong to that class of erratic artists, who are to be met with every day at the forum, where they wait till some one comes to request their services. His remarks, full of sense and precision, proclaim profound study, and consummate experience. Never will this depsitious bread, says he to one of them, obtain the necessary lightness by baking. The flour should have been passed through a Spanish sieve of linen thread. Use the Gallic sieve of horsehair for the autocrease, and one of papyrus or Egyptian rust for the coarser kinds of flour. The grasshoppers require great precaution, he exclaims an instant after, approaching a young Sicilian. Fry them so that they obtain only a light gold color. Then, passing to a third stove, he shows to one of his favorite pupils how to season highly an excellent sauce of snails, this hors d'oeuvre dear to the Romans, and by what marks to distinguish those fattened by art in particular enclosures from those which feed in gardens and are only fit for the common people. He then stops before a stew pan, where a cook is browning large worms of a whitish hue, which breed in the hollows of trees and are considered by the Romans a most delicious dish. The flour with which these kosi were fed was heated, says he. They will present to the teeth only a soft and insipid substance. We will not accompany this great master any further. His instructions are already known to us. An enthusiastic disciple of Apicius, he practices the lessons of that illustrious professor, and we should only hear from him precepts which we have already faithfully transmitted. When the moment of supper is arrived, we shall find the Archimagirus presiding at that gastronomic order of battle on which depends the success of the day. May Vesta and Comus be propitious to him. In the 14th century, the refectories and kitchens of the numerous communities of Paris presented a curious scene. 
immense coppers contained the pottage and boiled meat and monster gridirons on four wheels covered vast braziers all the utensils of these kitchens were of remarkable dimensions end of section twenty four Section 25 of Pantrophion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pantrophion by Alexis Sawyer. Section 25. Seasonings. The animal and vegetable kingdoms furnish us with an abundant and wholesome food, whose flavor gastronomic caprice unceasingly modifies by the aid of various substances which we denominate seasonings it is above all the perfect knowledge of these ingredients the manner of employing them and their skilful mixture which constitute the art of the cook labor and custom and a kind of routine which the palate acquires easily will suffice for those who content themselves with this calling and who carefully preserving the timid traditions of the past view progress as ruin and devastation, and the fruitful boldness of inspiration as ridiculous and fatal innovations. Heresy, and even schism, pardon these expressions, should be allowed in cookery as soon as they receive the sanctions of the doctors as banquets, the sole judges competent in such matters. It is to the art professed by Apicius that the celebrated line of Voltaire appears more peculiarly to apply. To le genre sont bon excepte la inio innovate then studious disciples of the illustrious roman consult only the measures of your strength the conscience of your genius and the infallible good taste of some chosen guests create for your seasoning unheard-of combinations the strangeness of which shall strike and astonish whose flavor shall subjugate and stifle criticism beneath the sweet efforts of a voluptuous mastication learn how to make your areopagitae eat this innocent seduction will ensure your triumph. Treat not with too much disdain these Roman recipes, for although the formidable list may excite a smile from the reader, and perhaps the scorn of the cook, a great and prolific idea slumbers beneath the cold ashes of the ovens of Apicius, which a breath may rekindle, and at the same time resuscitate some of those culinary wonders of a bygone civilization, and endow our modern age, so impatient of the future, so curious concerning the past two phoenicians whose names are never mentioned by forgetful posterity selec and misor taught mankind the art of heightening the flavor of their food by mixing with it a certain quantity of salt the science of seasoning has no other origin salt the law of moses commanded the jews to mix salt with everything offered in sacrifice this prescription sufficiently testifies the use of this condiment at an epoch which the uncertainty of profane writers appears to invade on all sides and which the great hebrew legislator alone enlightens with a ray invariably steady and pure the asphaltite lake produced abundance of salt it was sent even to rome and was considered by galen as the most desiccatory and digestive of any kind the greeks placed this substance in the list of things which ought to be consecrated to the gods and it is in this sense that homer gives it the epithet of divine pagan superstition of which some traces may still be remarked in the nineteenth century threatened with some great misfortune any one who spilt salt and it was deemed a signal impiety to forget placing salt cellars on the table or to dare go to sleep before removing them this strange superstition was common among the greeks and the romans those nations never failed consecrating their repasts by filling salt cellars near to the vase in which they presented the gods with the first portion of meat and fruit certain nations among others the numidians were not acquainted with salt and in the greater part of countries where it abounded cupidity almost invariably subjected it to a heavy tax which rendered its use less practicable the inhabitants of trode provided themselves for a long time with salt from treges without cost king lysimachus one day thought of exacting a duty for every measure carried away but wonderful to relate hardly was the royal edict published when the salt springs were found to be so nearly dried up that they hardly furnished wherewith to season a small stew lysimachus comprehended the meaning of this prodigy and abolished the tax the salt reappeared 
At Rome in the time of her kings every one was free to sell salt, and its price became excessively high. The Republican government withdrew this right from private individuals, and from that time the common people easily procured all the salt they required, and which they willingly eat with bread. Ancus Martius was the first Roman who established salt works near Ostia towards the mouth of the Tiber. Afterwards others were formed not only in Rome but in the provinces. These were of two kinds, public and private. The first belonged to the Republic and formed part of the Emperor's domain. Malefactors were condemned to labor in the salt works, and it was generally women on whom this punishment was inflicted. Ancus Martius was also the first who placed a duty on salt. It was abolished after the expulsion of the kings, but was afterwards again established. Down to the fourteenth century salt was a commodity of trade open to everyone in France. Philip the Long and Philip of Valois were the first to impose a momentary tax on it. But after the fatal battle of Poitiers, in which John was taken prisoner, Charles, his son, in order to pay the ransom of that monarch, had recourse, among other extraordinary means, to the establishment of the salt tax. The idea was found to be good, and it has never since been given up. There are four sorts of salt which are employed to season dishes obtained either from the evaporation of sea water, from certain lakes or salt marshes, and also from saliferous sources drawn out of the bosom of the earth in compact masses. Its particular savor is well known. It is soluble in water and easily becomes damp. In the scientific language, this substance is called hydrochlorate of soda. Brine. This was water in which bay salt had been dissolved. At Rome it was served at table to be mixed with the meat precisely in the same manner as we serve salt in salt cellars. The Romans plunged in this muria any fish or meat they might wish to preserve. Strong muria dura was water so completely saturated with bay salt that no more could be dissolved in it. Olives were washed in it. The brine most sought after was that of Antibes, of Thurium, and of Dalmatia. It was prepared with the blood and other juices which, after death, escaped from the tunny fish, mixed with garum, which rendered it more fluid and less expensive. At the end of the repast enigmas were often proposed to the guests. Some delicious dish served as a reward to those who were fortunate enough to guess them. The others were compelled to pour muria into their drink and swallow a cupful without taking breath. Digestive Salts the Romans were enormous eaters. Apicius, who was better aware of it than any one, imagined providing against those accidents to which his countrymen did not fear to expose themselves once every day, by offering to them a preparation which our habits of sobriety would, doubtless, render useless at the present day, but which the curious will not be sorry to discover in these sketches of antique gastrophagy. Take a pound of common salt, which torrefy and pulverize, mix it with three ounces of white pepper, two ounces of ginger, an ounce of limoni, an ounce and a half of thyme, as much of celery seed, three ounces of wild marjoram, an ounce and a half of rocket seed, three ounces of black pepper, an ounce and a half of holy thistle, two ounces of hyssop, two ounces of spikenard, two ounces of parsley, and two ounces of anise seed. Take a small quantity of these salts after a too plentiful dinner and the stomach will immediately defy the most imminent indigestion. Garum. When we have read all that has been written by the ancients on this famous preparation, we become convinced, in spite of the obscurities and continual contradictions of commentators, that if garum is no longer manufactured in the present day, it is not on account of the impossibility we find in discovering the recipe of the Greeks and the Latins, but solely because this rather strange brine has not the same charm for us that it had for them. Let us, however, scan the authorities. The Greeks called the shrimp garos, the Romans garus. It may hence be supposed that garum had originally for basis the flesh of shrimps, if Pliny had not taken the trouble to inform us of the fact. It was afterwards composed of other fish, but it always retained the name which recalled its origin. In like manner the signification of certain words is now applied to things quite different from the original type. Chicory or succory is received under the mask of coffee. A certain pottage boldly usurps the honors due exclusively to turtle soup. Nothing more easy than to multiply these examples of catechreses. There are few figures which have become so common. Well, then, they macerated the intestines of fish in water, saturated with salt, until putrefaction began to show itself. They then added parsley and vinegar. 
A thick garum was also frequently obtained by allowing the entrails and other parts generally thrown away to liquefy in salt. In the time of Pliny, mackerel was preferred, of which they employed either the gills and intestines or only the blood directly the fish left the water, and while yet living. They thus obtained a precious liquid in which the care necessary for its production rendered so dear that eight pints of it cost no less than from fifteen to twenty pounds. This expensive garum was especially esteemed when it came from Spain. It was then called garum of the allies, garum sociorum, because it was received from a nation allied with the Romans, or again perhaps in allusion to the band of gluttons of Rome, a sort of fraternity of free livers who made great use of it. The blood and entrails of the tunny fish mixed with salt in a vase produced also a most elaborate garum. A hole was made in the vessel at the expiration of two months, and the rich seasoning flowed from it. This brine became exquisite, and obtained an exorbitant price when made from the liver of anchovies macerated in vinegar, pepper, salt, parsley, garlic, white wine, and sweet herbs. But Apicius attained at the first step the apogee of refinement of the most sensual gluttony, by inventing garum made from the liver of red mullet. What we have already said elsewhere with regard to this fish will enable the reader to appreciate the value of this new preparation. Amateurs who were more economical contented themselves with very little saxatile fishes, of which only the intestines were taken or which were thrown whole into a vase with a great quantity of salt. These were exposed to the sun and the mixture long and often stirred. When heat had caused fermentation and the vessel contained only a kind of pulp, or paste, almost liquid, a kind of willow basket was introduced into which the garum alone could penetrate. The thick part, the dregs which remained at the bottom of the vase, was termed alec. The following method was also frequently adopted. Mackerel or small fish were placed in a small vase with a large quantity of salt. This was well stirred and the mixture was then left quiet all night. The next day it was transferred into an earthen pot which remained uncovered in the sun. At the end of two or three months it was hermetically closed after having added a quantity of old wine equal to one-third of the mixture. When it was wished to obtain garum without waiting any length of time, they took brine, carefully filtered, and so saturated with salt that an egg would float on it. This was placed with the fish in a new saucepan. Wild marjoram was added and the whole boiled over a gentle fire until the fish was entirely dissolved. Then wine, reduced to two-thirds by boiling, was added. It was left to get cold. The liquid was several times filtered till it became quite clear and was then finely placed in an uncovered vase. Although fish was generally used, the flesh of several animals was sometimes employed in the formation of garum. It was, however, submitted to the same preparations as those already mentioned. Such was this wonderful seasoning, forming the chief delight of the ancients whose praises poets have sung, and the composition of which formerly exercised the singularly mad intelligence of Maitre Francois Rabelais. The reader will doubtless remark that the principal elements of garum are almost invariably the same, fish, salt, and a greater or less fermentation. But perhaps someone may exclaim, this must be detestable. No doubt. But then no one ever thought of regaling himself with this liquid, it was never taken alone. It was but reserved as a seasoning for a host of dishes in order to heighten their flavor. It must also be observed that a skillful cook always took care to modify the garum before he sent it to the table by the helping of various ingredients, such as pepper, vinegar, Falernian wine, water, and oil, according to the use to which it was destined, or the degree of strength it was expedient it should possess. Hence that variety of seasonings with garum, sweet, sharp, mixed with water, wine, vinegar, and many other substances which changed or corrected the acid flavor of the primitive condiment though without in the least depriving it of the qualities which fermentation had communicated to it. It results from the different citations of which this chapter is composed that the recipes for the making of garum are to be obtained more easily than people seem to think at the present time. Everyone may not be of the same opinion with regard to the kind of fish generally used by the ancients to obtain this liquid, although all difficulties would be removed by admitting, which certainly is nothing but right, that they chose at one time mackerel or tunny fish, at others gudgeons and small sardines, sometimes even the red mullet in spite of its rarity and price. But it is evident that garum was prepared by either dissolving and liquefying these fish in their brine, either whole, their intestines, or their liver, 
and that to effect this it was only necessary to expose to the sun the vessel containing them, or that they simply put small fish into a dish with vinegar and parsley, placed it on a charcoal fire, and stirred it for some time when it was wanted for immediate use. It must have been remarked in reading this work that Apicius very frequently employs garum. He places it in every sauce, but never makes use of this seasoning unmixed, never does he serve it by itself as a special dish. This celebrated gastronomist has bequeathed us the recipe for a digestive garum. It is as follows. Mix with some honey half an ounce of pepper, three scruples of echelots, six scruples of cardamom, one scruple of spikenard, and six scruples of mint. Add vinegar to this mixture and then pour in some garum. The hippotrima, or stomachic condiment of the same master, merits also our attention. Mix carefully some pepper, benzoin, mint, pine nuts, dried raisins and dates, with fresh, not salt, cheese, vinegar, oil, honey, and wine, reduced by boiling to one half. Add garum to this mixture. The moritaria appears to be a variety of the hippotrima. It is a mixture of mint, rue, coriander, fennel, the whole fresh, with benzoin, pepper, honey, and vinegar. To this garum is added. Whatever may be the opinion the reader may form of this garum, of which mention has so frequently been made, and which has been alternately praised and despised by the moderns, it is certain that the most fastidious persons were madly fond of it, and that in the time of Pliny it was so much esteemed that its price equaled that of the most precious perfumes. At the present day this celebrated seasoning is forgotten in Italy, but in Turkey it is still in use. The innkeepers of Constantinople preserve in garum the cooked fish not consumed in the day. Bosque. Honey. What is sweeter than honey? What is more pure or more nourishing? It is the milk of the aged, it prolongs their existence, and when they descend into the tomb it still serves to embalm them. Pagan antiquity ascribed the honor of the discovery of this useful substance to the Athenian Aristeus, who taught mankind to feed on it. This valuable service procured him a patent of nobility. He was made a descendant of Bacchus or Apollo. It is not necessary to say that honey was known in the East long before the rise of Athens. It is already mentioned in the first book of the Holy Writings. It is said that Spain owed its knowledge of this delicious aliment to Gorgor, king of the Curites, who was polite enough to take some on the occasion of a journey which he made into that country. The peninsula could afterwards furnish this delicacy for the tables of Rome and Italy. The Greeks esteemed honey most highly. They employed it in pastry and in ragouts. Their philosopher Pythagoras eat nothing else with his bread, and as he lived to be ninety years old, he recommended his disciples to follow the same regime. They profited by the sage's counsel and found themselves all the better for it. A benevolent goddess protected bees, hives, and the honeycomb. She was called Malona, and a grateful piety offered her honey every New Year's Day. Theophrastus distinguished three kinds of honey, that which the bees extract from flowers, that which comes from the air, and lastly the honey from reeds. We clearly perceive that he means honey, manna, and sugar. Virgil thought that a gentle dew falls on the flowers, and became immediately the prey of bees which deposited it in their cells. Pliny has adopted the same graceful error, and even Galen himself partakes of it. The ancients caused honey to be served at the beginning of a repast. It was used in lieu of sugar in the preparation of preserves and some kinds of beverages which will hereafter claim our attention. They preferred that of Attica and insisted on its being thick, clear, granulated, transparent, fresh, and aromatic with a somewhat sharp flavor. The faculty attributed to it great virtues. Honey served as a basis to the wonderful seasoning of Apicius, which we present to the studious investigation of modern gastronomy. Put fifteen pounds of honey into a brass vessel containing two pints of wine. Warm at a very gentle fire, stir, and when it rises, pour over more wine. Let the mixture rise three times, then take it from the fire and skim it the next day. Then add four ounces of ground pepper, three scruples of gum, a drachm of spikenard, a drachm of saffron, five drachms of dried dates after softening them in wine. Pour on the whole eighteen pints of light wine. The oxyporon was another seasoning much in vogue two thousand years ago, and in which honey was the principal ingredient. It was composed by mixing two ounces of cumin seed, one ounce of ginger, one ounce of green rue, and six scruples of nitre with one ounce of pepper, and twelve scruples of fine dates, 
Nine ounces of honey were then poured over the whole. Sometimes they contented themselves with macerating cumin seed and vinegar, which they left to dry, and then pounded it. That done, it was put into honey. The honey most esteemed is the white, granulated, and of an aromatic flavor. The honey from the French provinces of Narbonne, the Gatine, or Brittany, is the most esteemed. Honey is next of kin to sugar, having the same properties. It is frequently used in domestic economy and in medicine as a laxative. It enters into a number of remedies, either as a corrective or an excipient. Dictio in cycle. Sugar. Theophrastus, the first among the ancients who speaks of sugar, classes it among the number of honeys. Discorides also calls it honey of reeds. He adds that these reeds grow in India or in Arabia, Felix, and that the agreeable substance they contain has some analogy with salt. Pliny also gives it the same name. It is, according to this naturalist, a kind of honey with which certain reeds are filled and used only in medicine. This was also the opinion of many ancient authors, one of whom, Paul Agneta, calls sugar, Indian salt. The sugar cane appears to be originally a native of the East Indies. From the most remote ages the Chinese have understood the art of cultivating it. The histories of the Egyptians, Phoenicians, and Jews make no mention of it. The Greek physicians are the first who speak of it. It was not till the year 1471 that a Venetian discovered the method of purifying brown sugar and making loaf sugar. He gained an immense fortune by this discovery. Sugar cane, well purified and disburdened of all foreign matter, is white, solid, inodorous, soluble in water, of a soft and agreeable savor. Its specific gravity is 1.6065. It is used as a seasoning in a multitude of dishes, in preparing syrups, preserving of fruits, etc., etc. Cinnamon In the time of Theophrastus it was said that cinnamon grew in a dark and silent valley guarded night and day by fearful serpents. Animated by the hope of gain, some individuals, careless of their existence, risked their lives by gathering some of this precious bark. When they had the good luck to avoid the vigilant reptiles, they consecrated to the sun part of their booty, which the radiant orb immediately consumed to prove his acceptance of the offering. Others, thinking this little tale on the subject of cinnamon rather too dramatic, pretended that the shrub furnishing it was found only on high mountains, to which man was forbidden all access. But fortunately certain birds, the phoenix among others, great amateurs of aromatics, make their nests of its small branches. These nests are taken, and in this manner, whether the year be good or bad, a sufficient stock of cinnamon is obtained without much trouble. Pliny recognizes two kinds of it, one white, the other black, both of which were brought to Rome from Ethiopia in the reign of Vespasian. Eighty years after, A.D. 164, Galen informs us that cinnamon was still very scarce in Italy, that the emperors alone possessed any, and that they even preserved it among the curiosities they made it their pleasure to collect and keep in their palaces. The same writer regards this so precious and uncommon cinnamon as an excellent cordial and a good digestive. We may add that it was only well known in Europe after the frequent voyages of the Portuguese to India. However, in 1168 an abbot of St. Gilles in Languedoc, having a favor to ask of Louis de Lejeune, thought there was no better means of persuading him to grant it than to send him a small stock of cinnamon. Our forefathers in the Middle Ages had their tables furnished with cinnamon sauce, nutmeg, mustard, and garlic sauces, cold sauces, parsley and vinegar sauces, hot sauces, hell sauces, burger sauces, cherry, plum, mulberry, grape, gorse, rose, and flower sauces. They were served with roast meat. Cinnamon is daily employed in medicine and diarrhea, several fevers, etc., etc., and in pharmacy. That from China is much thicker than the others, its color darker and its odor more powerful. Essential oil is drawn from it and preserved in flagons sealed with the arms of government and sold at a very high price. Cloves Cloves were very little known to the ancients. Theophrastus, Discorides, and Galen do not speak of them. Pliny says that some cloves were brought to Rome very similar to grains of pepper, but a little longer, that they were only to be found in India in a wood consecrated to the gods, and that they served in the fabrication of perfumes. The conquest of India by the Portuguese rendered them common throughout Europe. 
Cloves contained a considerable quantity of essential aromatic oil, thick brown and very heavy, to which it owes its aromatic properties and sharp burning savor. Cloves are employed as a seasoning or as medicine. Pepper The two great cities of antiquity knew how to appreciate pepper and employed it largely in their culinary labors. They distinguished two kinds, one round, the other long and thin. Discorides and Pliny describe the shrub on which are to be seen pods filled with seeds of pepper, resembling millet according to the first of these writers, and like small beans according to the other. Our readers no doubt remember the importance which Apicius ascribes to pepper in the learned recipes of that skillful Archimagyrus. Verjuice. Verjuice, the use of which is very ancient, was used more in pharmaceutical preparations than in the seasoning of food. Galen attributes to it refreshing qualities and advises it in certain cases. Verjuice is a kind of grape, very acid, and which never gets perfectly ripe. The suck of verjuice is used in medicine and culinary preparations as an astringent. The juice is not proper to make wine, but a very agreeable syrup is obtained from it. Vinegar The greater part of ancient nations were acquainted with the use of vinegar. Reapers in the east soaked their bread in it to freshen it. The Greeks esteemed that of canide, of sphet, of cleon, and above all the vinegar of Egypt, which was reputed to be the best among the Romans, who tempered its acrimony by mixing it with some sweet substance. These masters of the world did not fancy they possessed all the comforts of life when they wanted vinegar. Therefore they always had a large provision of it in their cellars, as all their seasonings proved. This passion, for it certainly amounted to a passion, is easily explained by the admirable qualities they attributed to the pungent liquid. It was believed to be astringent, digestive, antibilious, refreshing, and an antiscorbutic. Mixed with water it was the drink of the soldiers, who, thanks to this beverage, braved the intemperance of the seasons in the different climates of Europe, Africa, and Asia. The Greeks and Romans esteemed highly their pickles. These consisted of flowers, herbs, roots, and vegetables preserved in vinegar, and which kept a long time in cylindrical vases with wide mouths. They were prepared with the greatest care, and these plants were often macerated in oil, brine, and vinegar, with which they were impregnated drop by drop. Meat also cut in very small pieces was treated in the same manner. Vinegar of an exorbitant price was obtained from some precious wines, and that price was again increased by the proverbial cupidity of some butlers in great houses. We doubt much, however, whether any of those worthy personages ever made such a bill as a certain French seigneur dared to do under the reign of Louis the Thirteenth. It is said that the Duke de la Meilleray, Grand Master of the Artillery of France, presented to the minister a bill in which figured an article of 1,300,000 francs, 52,000 pounds, for vinegar to cool the cannons. The sum appeared rather large, but la Meilleray was a near relation of Richelieu, and the article passed without the least contestation. A truffled turkey was to be eaten at a dinner where Buffon was invited. A few minutes before sitting down to table, an elderly lady inquired of the celebrated naturalist where the truffle grew. At your feet, madame. The lady did not understand, but it was thus explained to her. C'est au pied des charmes. Yoke elm tree. The compliment appeared to her most flattering. Towards the end of the dinner, someone asked the same question of the illustrious writer, who, forgetting that the lady was beside him, innocently replied, the grow opeds de vieux charmes, old yoke elm trees. The lady overheard him and no longer thought anything of his amiability. Nevertheless, Buffon was right. It was around the yoke elm trees of Lamsacus, Acarnidea, Alopicomesia, and Ales that these famous truffles were discovered, whose reputation was spread in all parts in which Italy envied Greece. The truffle beloved treasure that the earth conceals within her bosom as she does the precious metals, which she seems to have yielded grudgingly to the patient researches of the gastronomist. The magiric records do not tell us at what memorable epoch this exquisite tubercle astonished, for the first time, the palate of man. But a doubtful tradition maintains that a vile animal, a pig, guided by his marvellous gluttony, found out the existence of this pearl of banquets. Pliny was very much inclined to range the truffles amidst the astonishing prodigies. He fancied that he saw it at its birth increase without roots, 
without the slightest fiber, without the least capillary vessel likely to transmit to it nutritious juices. Therefore he believed that sown by thunderbolts in the autumnal storms, this daughter of thunder grew like minerals by juxtaposition, and relates on this subject the history of Lardius Licinius, governor of Spain, who while biting a truffle with avidity broke one of his teeth against a Roman denarius, which chance alone had enclosed within it. The Greeks thought a great deal of a delicious species of truffles, smooth outside, red within, which were found just under the surface of the ground, and did not show the slightest appearance of vegetation. Another kind was also much sought after by amateurs, probably on account of their scarcity. They were originally from Africa, and called Cyrenaic, white outside, of an excellent perfume and exquisite flavor. The Athenians, enlightened appreciates of all sorts of merits, accepted with gratitude a ragout with truffles invented by Kyrips. That culinary genius did not long enjoy his glory. A premature death carried him off from his stoves, his honors, and his fortune. But the Greeks did not bury their gratitude in his tomb. His sons became citizens of Athens, and the name of their father, more fortunate than that of Christopher Columbus, clung forever to his brilliant discovery. The doctors of other days did not exactly agree upon the quality either good or bad of truffles. Philozenes, whose opinion met with many partisans, would have it that a great quantity should be eaten cooked under the ashes and deliciously impregnated with a succulent sauce. It was, however, recommended to choose them with the most particular attention, because some had the reputation of being as poisonous as mushrooms. The Romans were as fond of truffles as the Greeks, and that is not saying little. Apicius gives a method of preparing them which is as follows. After they are boiled in water, put a little stick through them, and then place them for an instant before the fire. Season them afterwards with oil, a little meat gravy, some skirrets, wine, pepper, and honey in proper proportions. When the sauce is boiling, make a thickening and serve. The illustrious Epicurean prepared them also with pepper, benzoin, coriander, and rue, to which he added a little honey, oil, and gravy. The estimable Platina insists that in the first place truffles should be washed in wine, and afterwards cooked under the ashes, and that they be served hot and sprinkled over with salt and pepper. This is the composition of a syrup of truffles, taken from the old Arabian medicine. We believe it to be very little known, and should not be surprised if it were some day to obtain the renown it seems to deserve. It was composed of truffles, balm, and holy thistle boiled in water with sugar, and to each pound of the decoction was added one scruple of water distilled from honey, and half an ounce of some spirit, say for example spirits of wine, to each pound of liquor. The whole was aromatized with musk and a little rose water. Two ounces of this syrup were administered hot in cases of weakness. Salmasius, who knew much of the Greek tongue and very little of cookery, aversed that the ancients knew two different kinds of truffles. One species was similar to ours, and the other a variety from Africa already mentioned, white outside and the size of a quince. Leo the African says that the Arabs cook these truffles in milk, and that they think them exquisite. Thereupon Salmasius exclaims against the insipidity of this dish, or the ignorance of Leo the African, and immediately points out with an air of triumph the celebrated Avicenna, who informs us that after the truffles were peeled and cut in small pieces, they were cooked in water and salt, and then dished up with oil, benzoin, and spices. Salmasius will have it that Avicenna's truffles had no other flavor than that given by the sauce, and he has no forgiveness for those poor Arabs who dared to dress them otherwise. If this clever Hellenist had studied this savory tubercule with as much care as he bestowed on the writers of the history of Augustus, he would have learned that the peculiar perfume which distinguishes it retains, in the midst of seasoning, the most laboriously prepared, the same power it possesses when eaten by itself and without any dressing. Apicius had less of literature than Salmasius, but he was most assuredly gifted in a very superior degree with that mens divinor, which makes great cooks and illustrious poets. This assimilation has nothing surprising in it, if we only remember that genius is nothing else than the faculty of producing and whoever bequeathed to posterity productions more exquisite than those of Archistrates and Apicius. Let us hear from this latter how to preserve truffles. You must be careful not to put them in contact with water, that is to say they ought to be kept very dry. They are placed separately in vessels and covered with iron filings or sawdust. 
close each vessel hermetically with plaster and keep them in a dark and cool place. The truffle is a very remarkable vegetable, which, without stems, roots, or fibers, grows of itself, isolated in the bosom of the earth, absorbing the nutritive juice. Its form is round, more or less regular, its surface is smooth or tuberculous, the color dark brown outside, brown, gray, or white within. Its tissue is formed of articulated filaments between which are spheric vesicles, and in the interior are placed reproductive bodies, small brown spheres called truffinelles. Truffles vegetate to the depth of five or six inches in the high sandy soils of the southwest of France, of Piedmont, etc., etc. Their mode of vegetation and reproduction is not known. Dogs are trained to find them, as well as pigs and boars also, who are very fond of them. They are eaten cooked under the ashes or in wine and water. They are preserved when prepared in oil, which is soon impregnated with their odor. Poultry is stuffed with them, also geese's livers, pies, and cooked pork, besides numerous ragouts. They possess, it is said, exciting virtues. Mushrooms Agrippina, desirous of securing the crown to her worthy son Nero, went to a celebrated female poisoner and procured a venomous preparation which defied the most powerful antidotes. The princess slipped this terrible poison in a very fine morel, a species of mushroom, which Claudius eat at his supper. The unfortunate emperor died according to the desire of his amiable consort, who was, of course, inconsolable for a long time, and placed among the gods the husband she had murdered. Nero ascended the throne and every time that mushrooms were served at his table, true to the memory of his father-in-law, he facetiously called this preparation the dish of the gods. To the poisonous effects of this vegetable have been attributed also the death of the emperor Tiberius, that of Pope Clement the Seventh, King Charles the Sixth of France, and many other important personages who either knew very little of good cooks or of morels. Notwithstanding these tragic events, mushrooms always retained a proud position among the ancients, above the most inoffensive culinary plants, and their rather doubtful reputation has not prevented them from maintaining their ground down to our time, for we find that they now claim the same rank which they formerly occupied in gastronomic reunions of Athens and Rome. A sad image of those fortunate criminals whom society dreads, and yet often loads with its favors. This voluptuous poison, as Seneca the philosopher calls it, which compels us to eat of it again, even when not hungry, was much relished by the wealthy inhabitants of Roman Italy. These free livers, careless of the morrow, preferred the field mushroom, which they devoured with delight, having previously covered it over with a pungent sauce, which they afterwards neutralized with various iced beverages. It is true that this dish worthy of the gods often inflicted a severe penalty on those who yielded to its irresistible seduction. But what mortal could think of the anguish of an uncertain poisoning, when he had the good luck to meet with some boledi, or mushrooms of the rarest description, which the price of a beautiful toga would hardly have purchased, and which promised some mouthfuls of ineffable though ephemeral enjoyment? Besides, does not pleasure possess more piquant charms when danger is attached to it? The greater part of mushrooms are very dangerous, say the ancients. But blind destiny perhaps reserves for us certain kinds which are not so. Reassured by this judicious reflection, they gave orders to their cooks to stew some and season them with vinegar, oxymel, and honey. However reasonable people, and there were still some to be found, abstained entirely from this vegetable or procured it by the method which Nicander recommends. That is to say, they frequently watered the trunk of a fig tree after the manure had been placed around it. That philosopher assures us that by these means we may grow mushrooms perfectly wholesome. Those of our readers who are in possession of fig trees will be able to give their opinion on the merit of Nicander's method. To obtain the seeds of most mushrooms, it only requires to expose them when fresh upon glass. The superficies of the glass is soon covered with it. It is also obtained by shaking in the water the mushrooms which are sufficiently developed. This water thus impregnated is used to water the beds, which become thereby more productive. The natural supply of mushrooms from the fields not being thought sufficient, the art of raising them on beds during the whole year was therefore indispensable and required a mixture of crotton de cheval, 
rotten dung, and mold, which is deposited in layers of one foot and a half in thickness and width. Seeds of mushrooms are sown on these beds, that is to say, some of the mold of a former bog impregnated with it. It is then covered over with all the dung not consumed and then copiously watered. At the end of a very few days the beds begin to produce mushrooms and keep on producing until the winter. Bosque. End of section 25. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 26 of Pantrophion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Pantrophion by Alexis Soyer. Pastry. The art of the pastry cook consists in preparing certain delicate and nice pastes in all sorts of shapes, in seasoning them with discretion and in sufficient quantity, with meat, butter, sugar, preserves, etc. It is a most important branch of the culinary science, unceasingly occupied with flattering the sight as much as the taste. It raises graceful monuments, delicious fortresses, seductive ramparts, which, as soon as they are on all sides attacked, totter, crumble, and no longer present anything but glorious and ephemeral ruins, like every other work of man. All pass away whether they be temples, columns, pyramids, or pies. This charming art was known to ancient nations as soon as their intellectual development had enabled them to understand a certain gastronomic truth, long since become a trivial axiom, and of which we dare scarcely remind the reader. On ne mange pour vitre que lorsque on ne sait pas vitre pour manger. People only eat to live when they do not understand how to live to eat. The original nations were acquainted with the art of making pastry at a very early period. The Egyptians served many different sorts of cakes at their tables. The Jews knew of at least three kinds. One sort kneaded with oil, another fried in oil, and the last was merely rubbed over with oil the enlightened gluttony of the greeks and romans inspired them with a host of combinations more or less ingenious and destined to revive a failing appetite or one already greatly compromised by vigorous onslaughts some of these pastries would appear very nice to us in the present day others we should think but little worthy of the epicure of rome and athens however let us not be in too great a hurry to condemn these great masters doubtless they had excellent reasons to like that which modern tastes may despise and dislike in return they might have thought some of our most fashionable dishes detestable Perhaps Apicius might have made a strange grimace at the sight of a dish of sauerkraut, or an olopedra, or an immense plum pudding. Opolis, a light dainty for those who have weak stomachs, were thin sheets of paste composed of flour and honey, which rolled into a spiral form as soon as they approached the oven they were eaten soaked in cooked wine persons of taste preferred oblies to fritters a bold mixture of flour kneaded with wine seasoned with pepper and then worked up with milk and finally with a little fat or oil some cooks employed the finest flour only mixed with oil and served this paste after having cooked it in a dish others worked sesame flour in long time with honey and oil and fried it these various kinds of fritters were 
doubtless much sought after by the populace for cicero speaks of them with profound disdain the jews less dainty than the eloquent orator offered some of this paste in sacrifice the recipe for its composition is given in lefetus it was made of the finest flour moistened with oil and cooked in the frying pan women and children these two fragile roots of society were always fond of sweet and delicate cakes the pastry cooks of attica prepared for them some very excellent kinds sometimes it was merely a sweet mixture of honey and milk others were made of honey sesame flour and cheese or oil delicious fruit was frequently covered with a light and perfumed paste these athenian dumplings met with a great success rome made the conquest of these precious recipes and vanquished greece conquered by her had still the glory of dictating laws to her haughty enemy she imposed her cookery gingerbread was not unknown to the ancients rhodes owed its reputation to it it was sweetened with honey and that island furnished it to the whole of europe the greeks called this delicacy melitates and eat it with pleasure at the close of their repasts let us not forget in this rapid survey of ancient sweets that learned and exquisite mixture now designated under the name of nougat which among the greeks was composed of dried currants and almonds and which has lost none of its attractions nothing of its celebrity after so many centuries the muscatium did not deserve to occupy so high a standing and yet this rustic cake composed of sweet wine and flour a symbol of abundance and happiness never failed to be presented to the guests at a wedding repast and the newly married pair sent a piece of it to each of their absent parents or friends who in return addressed them congratulations and wishes for their happiness the muscatium was the wedding cake of the romans modern civilization has also rejected with equal disdain the savillium pie always eaten with pleasure by the voluptuous inhabitants of rome when they went to their villas in order to rest from their prodigious excesses and from the fatigues of intemperance this nourishing and agreeable dish required but little art in its composition half a pound of flour and two pounds and a half of cheese were well mixed together three ounces of honey and one egg were then added when the whole had been well beaten it was placed in an earthen vessel rubbed over with oil and which was covered with a tart dish cover it was carefully watched to see that the process of cooking was going on afterwards it was taken from the dish the pie was smeared with honey and for an instant replaced under the tart dish cover after having dredged the top with pounded poppy seed it was always served in the dish in which it had been cooked and was eaten with spoons we have already mentioned the artocress a kind of hashed meat mixed with bread which rome borrowed from greece together with its original name this pie welcomed by modern gastrophagy has reached our days with merely some slight modifications and deprived of its sonorous hellenic appellation formerly the roman emperors for the greater part ruled badly but in return they eat well in that gastronomic era gone never to return caesar's supper engaged the attention of the court the city nay the whole empire the conquered universe furnished the details for a banquet and a royal hand sometimes deigned to write the ordinance now and then even the monarch wrapped in profound culinary meditations long reflected 
dictated to his archimagus a new dish on which complacent senators the next day bestowed enthusiastic praises and a sincere admiration thus the emperor verus inventor of a pie barely escaped an opetheus of which his genius was deemed worthy it is true that without an exaggerated flattery this pie was excellent and that never was there imagined a more happy mixture a more ingenious combination of meats or a more refined flavor if any one be curious enough to wish to test this imperial dish let him prepare a succulent amalgamation of a sow's flank sumen peasant peacock iced ham and wild boar's flesh let him enclose this mixture within the thick casing of a laboriously worked crust and he may attack this kingly dish when a gentle and slow cooking causes it to emit burning yet sweet emanations here is a more modest recipe for a cake but then it does not claim the paternity of an emperor however cato brought it much into fashion for the wise cato often busied himself in the science of cookery for which reasons he is greatly worthy of esteem well we recommend to the reader for the libium of that philosopher who indicates the manner of preparing it crush he says two pounds of cheese mix with it a pound of rye flour or in order to render it lighter throw in merely half a pound of wheat flour and an egg stir mix and work this paste form of it a cake which you will place on leaves and cook in a tart dish on the hot hearth this libium was much esteemed about twenty centuries ago in honor of cato may it again be brought to light if not completely unworthy of our attention could we not also rehabilitate the reputation of the most celebrated of ancient pies the placenta which so delighted mankind and by which the gods even allowed their fury to be appeased renowned writers have granted it the authority of their praise and the illustrious geopontist already cited describes with lengthened compliance the manner of preparing this important dish place on one side two pounds of rye flour which will serve to form the foundation on which must be placed biscuits formed of crisp paste on the other put four pounds of wheat and two pounds of alisa grains of fine wheat stripped of their husk and crushed to which was added in order to whiten them a peculiar kind of chalk found between naples and pozzoli this latter must be left to infuse in water and when well soaked it must be thrown into a kneading trough and well worked with the hand you then mix with it the four pounds of wheat flour in order to make the whole into biscuits or dry march pans this paste must be worked in a basket and as it dries each separate march pan must be shaped when they have acquired a convenient form rub them on all sides with a piece of stuff soaked in oil and the same must be done to the foundation of the placenta before placing the march pans on it during these preparations make the hearth very hot as well as the cover of the tart dish intended to cook it then spread the two pounds of rye flour you have in reserve over fourteen pounds of cheese of sheep's milk make of this a light paste for the foundation already mentioned this cheese ought to be very fresh and previously soaked in three waters it is allowed to drain slowly between the hands 
and when it has been left to dry it is kneaded take a flour sieve and pass the cheese through it before mixing it with the rye then add four pounds and a half of good honey mix well place the foundation furnished with its band on a board a foot square covered with bay leaves rib rubbed with oil and form the placenta begin by covering the whole of the base with a layer of marsh pans which you place one after the other and cover slightly with cheese mixed with honey finally you arrange the marsh pans on the foundation and prepare the hearth to a moderate degree of heat place the placenta on it cover it with the tart dish cover already heated and spread live charcoal underneath and all around the cooking must be done very slowly and as soon as the pie is taken from the hearth it must be rubbed with honey the great desire we had to inform the reader of some of the methods of making ancient pastry will perhaps induce him to receive with indulgence the rather diffuse recipe of the worthy cato the following is much more concise it relates to the relishing globi little globes or balls eaten at dessert mix cheese and alicia and of this mixture make the globi which cook one after the other or two at a time in boiling oil stir them constantly with a spoon take them out rub them over with honey and serve having previously dredged over them a little poppy seed every one will confess that all these cakes are inferior to the simple and elegant pastry with which the inhabitants of Pisium, marshes of anconda regaled themselves they placed some alicia to soak in water and left it there for the space of nine days the tenth day they kneaded it and formed it into round flat cakes which they cooked in the oven in earthen baking dishes easily broken when these kind of biscuits were to be eaten they were first softened in milk and honey apicius also made globi of great delicacy with the crumb of fine bread shaped into balls which are left to soak in milk and which on their being withdrawn from the boiling oil he lightly covered with honey we conclude with three recipes from this amateur cook in the hope that they may appear worthy of his genius mix pine nuts pepper honey rue and cooked wine cover with eggs well beaten submit this mixture to a low fire and serve after having smeared it with honey cook the finest flour in some milk of which make a tolerably stiff paste spread it on a dish cut it into pieces which when you have fried in very fine oil cover with pepper and honey make a compact mixture of milk honey and eggs let it cook very slowly and serve after having sprinkled over it a little pepper these details will we hope give a sufficient idea of ancient pastry we must remember that these recipes form as it were the starting point the oil fritter of the hebrews and the meringues of our period are wide apart more than thirty-three centuries separate the two two thousand years have elapsed since cato wrote the recipe for his somewhat heavy tart the author of the culinary art apicius himself is very old the private life of the ancient people appears to be worthy of serious study but we too often only bestow it on our disdain the author of this work has observed their customs in the kitchen and in the dining room the only places to which he had access and he has taken the liberty of writing the result of his investigations sometimes he admires 
but never does he despise a civilization different to our own but which was not without its good side he conjures the reader to believe him when he says that whatever eccentricities the gastronomy of ancient nations may present to us those people he has perhaps acquired the right to venture such an assertion doubtless eat in a very different manner from ourselves but they certainly knew how to eat the pastry just mentioned is certainly not altogether irreproachable that is clear but many kinds reveal that exquisite sentiment of the good which is nothing else than taste whether it relate to art literature or cooking and the entire development of which seems to have been the opportunists of a small number of privileged centuries great epochs such as those of percules augustus leo the twelfth louis the fourteenth and queen anne have seen roses and myrtles flourish by the side of the laurels with which the muses are crowned charles the twelfth was fond of tartlets frederick the second gave himself fits of indigestion by eating savoy cakes and the marshal de saxe rested from the fatigues of glory before a plate of macaroons we have renounced the kind of pastry with which our ancestors used to regale themselves in the fourteenth century their stag pies are no longer in vogue neither have we any taste for the great pies which contained a lamb or a stuffed kid surrounded with goslings by dozens and scores their tarts have fallen into the same oblivion who thinks now of their janus or double-faced tarts herb tarts rose-leaf tarts oak tarts or chestnut tarts the first statutes given to the pastry cooks by st louis may twelve seventy sanctioned their custom of working on all festival days without exception now the motive for such a toleration was probably this the pagans had their festivals which they passed in banqueting the romans called them dies epiculate the early christians although they gave up the worship of false gods preserved certain customs in which they had been brought up among which was that of public and private banquets on festival days we still see some remains of these customs in the village rejoicings on the continent on the day of their patron saint the fathers of the church and the councils raised their voices against this abuse but they were obliged to tolerate it and the pastry cooks who were very busy on those occasions profited by the indulgence it is as well to remark that they were at one and the same time publicans roasters that is they would roast anything for anybody and cooks under the ministry of the chancellor de hôpital little pies or patties were hawked through all the streets of paris and there was an enormous consumption of them the severe minister considered them a luxury which it was incumbent upon him to suppress so he prohibited not their sale but the crying of them as a temptation to gluttony there is a kind of cake much in vogue in england on good friday designated hot cross bun because it always marked with a cross the reader will perhaps take some interest in the observations of bryant on the subject of this pastry the offerings says he which people in ancient times used to present to the gods were generally purchased at the entrance of the temple especially every species of consecrated bread which was denominated accordingly 
one species of sacred bread which used to be offered to the gods was of great antiquity and called boon it was a kind of cake with a representation of two horns julius pollux mentions it after the same manner a sort of cake with horns diogenes laureus speaking of the same offering being made by empedocles describes the chief ingredients of which it was composed he offered one of the sacred libra called a bonce bonds which was made of fine flour and honey england seems then to have retained the name and the form of the ancient bonds though the people do not recognize in the bun anything sacred or holy titus livy said in speaking of rome the greatest things have small beginnings this applies equally to pastry which appears so unworthy of attention at the commencement of the middle ages that nothing seems to announce its high destiny at first in the southern provinces people simply mix flour oil and honey the roman school was still in force the inhabitants of the north had a mind to innovate they employed eggs butter and salt then came the idea of enclosing within this paste cooked meat seasoned with bacon and spices and from progress to progress they at last enclosed cream fruit and marmalades we find pastry mentioned for the first time in a charter of louis debonair 802 it is there said that a certain farm of the abbey of st denis is to furnish at certain festivals sixteen measures of honey eleven hundred oxen and five hogsheads of flour to make pastry a charter of the church of paris twelve hundred and two mentions shinnels or wigs under the name of pain lev qui dicatur echande joinville speaks in the life of st louis of cheese fritters cooked in the sun which the sacrans presented to that king and his knights when they restored them to liberty and finally so early as the thirteenth century the flans of chartres the patties of paris and the tarts of dorlans were in great renown and a charter of thirteen o one informs us that as the epoch several lords imposed on their vassals a tribute of fugues or puff pastry the cook of charles v says that the word torte signified a household loaf of a round form that this name was afterwards given to delicate pastry and that by corruption it was called tart in certain provinces Tallyvent speaks of cream almonds and rose water as the accompaniments of darioles a kind of custard and of talmoses a sort of cheese cake made of cheese eggs and butter colored with the yolks of eggs platina cites tarts made with radishes quinces gourds elderberry flowers rice oatmeal millet chestnuts cherries dates may herbs roses and lastly the white or cream tart End of section 26. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 27 of Pantrophion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pantrophion by Alexis Sawyer section twenty seven water thales who borrowed from egypt the elements of philosophy which he afterwards spread in greece taught that water is the vivifying principle of all things 
that nature is thereby made fruitful, and that without it the earth, arid and laid waste, would be a frightful desert, where every effort of man to support his existence must fail. These ideas, for a long time adopted by pagan theology, peopled fountains, rivers, and seas with divinities, and often confounded in the same worship those gods, sons of gratitude, with the limpid waters consecrated to them. The Persians carried their veneration for this element so far that they dared not wash their hands and would have preferred being consumed to the very bone rather than dip themselves in a river. The Cappadocians were proud of treading in the same path. The Egyptians offered prayers and homage to water. The Nile in particular received their adorations under the name of Epeus or Cirrus, and they offered to it as a sacrifice barley, wheat, sugar, and fruit. The Scythians honored the Danube on account of its vast extent. The Thessalians prostrated themselves before the majestic shores of the Peneus. The ancient combat of Achilles with Hercules made it sacred to the Aetolians. By a special law the Lacedaemonians were compelled to implore the Eurotas, and a religious precept forced the Athenians to incense in honor of the Elysses. The Greeks and Romans did not fail to follow such good examples. The fountains and rivers had their altars. The Rhine was called a god, and when Aeneas arrived in Italy he prayed that it might be favorable to him. However strange such superstition may appear, it is nevertheless conceivable that paganism, struck with wonder at the flux and reflux of the sea and at the phenomena presented by several celebrated springs and seduced by the charming fictions of doubtful poesy, should have deified an element both beneficial and terrible, since it could not cry out with the prophet king, the Lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters, yea, than the mighty waves of the sea. Thence came the innumerable number of tutelary gods to which the ocean alone gave an asylum. By Thetes it became the father of the seventy-two Oceanides and the fifty Nereides called it their grandfather. Hesiod numbered three thousand nymphs, and he probably forgot a few of them. We say nothing of the Naiades, the Napii, the Lemnides, and so many others whom Fable was pleased to recognize and whom it described as joyfully disporting in the water. Greece exhausted the treasures of its poetical imagination to embellish her fountains, beloved retreats of the timid Naiades. Several were remarkable for the beauty of their architecture and the extreme delicacy of their execution. Megara in Achaea possessed one celebrated for its magnificence. That of Pyrene at Corinth was surrounded with white marble in which were placed grottoes which unceasingly supplied a vast and superb basin. Another fountain of Corinth, named Lerna, offered to loungers an elegant portico, under which some very commodious seats allowed them to enjoy during summer the freshness which the water communicated to the atmosphere. In the sacred wood of Aesculapius at Epidaurus, a splendid fountain was seen whose marvelous beauty attracted all eyes. Lastly, those of Messina, known under the names of Arsinoe and of Clepsydra, yielded nothing in richness of material and finish of details to the most renowned monuments of Greece. The Athenians named four officers to keep watch and ward over the water. The other Greek towns followed the example. These officers had to keep the fountains in order and clean the reservoirs so that the water might be preserved pure and limpid. The Romans at first contented themselves with water from the Tiber. King Ancus Martius was the first to build aqueducts, destined to convey the water of the fountain of Piconia from Tiber to Rome, a distance of about 33,000 paces. Some have honored the censor Appius Claudius for this magnificent undertaking, to whom is certainly due the celebrated Appian Way. These gigantic works greatly multiplied in time. Under the reign of Nero, Rome had nine principal aqueducts constructed the pipes of which were of bricks, baked tile, stone, lead, or wood. According to the calculation of Vigenerus, 500,000 hogshead of water were conveyed into Rome every 24 hours by 10,850 small channels, the internal circumference of which was one inch. The water was received in large closed basins above which were raised splendid monuments. These basins, or Chateau d'Eau, Castella Aquarum, supplied other subterraneous conduits connected with the various quarters of the town, which conveyed water to small reservoirs, fonts, furnished with taps for the exclusive use of certain streets. The water, which was not drinkable, ran out by means of large pipes into extensive enclosures where it served to water cattle. At these places the people washed their linen, 
and here too they had a ready resource in case of fire. Augustus created water commissaries who took care that all water coming into Rome by the aqueducts was fairly distributed in every public place, and to those of the inhabitants who had obtained the privilege of having it enter their houses. But the ingenious thirst of the conquerors of the world could not content itself with the delicious water which nature furnished free of expense. Was it not too much for human endurance that not only the air and the sun could not be offered to the highest bidder, but that the same spring was to quench the thirst of obscure plebeians on equal terms with the rich patrician? Intemperance and luxury very soon contrived to find excellent means of remedying a state of things so intolerable. The custom of preserving snow in cellars to obtain cool beverages is very old. Aristotle pointed out the method of boiling water and putting the vessel afterwards in snow in order to obtain ice. Rome had recourse to this expedient, which was afterwards replaced with advantage under Nero, by constructing ice-houses for the use of opulent Epicureans. This even was not enough for voluptuous Romans, slaves to their strange caprices. Their beverages did not appear to them as yet sufficiently cool, and the summit of the Alps was put under contribution to furnish ice for the fashionable tables of the imperial city. The Romans were also frequently supplied with snow water, clarified by being passed through the column navarium, or snow colander, a charming little utensil of silver, pierced with a great number of holes through which the iced beverage passed into a recipient beneath. This drink was sometimes mortal, but always exquisite. From this vessel it was poured into an ampulla, or a sort of crystal bottle of rotund form, which was often enormously dear on account of the elaborate chasing with which it was embellished. This water bottle, with its long and narrow neck, was the principal ornament of the sideboards and tables, when it bore the name of some skilful artist from Campania, or the Isle of Samos. Iced beverage lost all its charm at the end of the fine season, and hot water took its place during winter. The same custom existed in Greece in the best classes of society. At Rome it was much more general, for there were a great number of taverns where the middle classes and citizens of the lowest order gorged themselves copiously with pork and warm water. The Emperor Claudius caused them to be closed and severely punished the proprietors of those houses who opposed his ordinance. At the commencement of the repast a copper vessel was placed on the table purposely to boil water. It was much like a French bouillard, which nearly resembles a tankard and contained a cylinder of about four inches in diameter covered with a moving lid, and pierced with holes for the ashes to pass through. They fell into the lower part of the cylinder. The space around was filled with water by means of a small funnel soldered to the boiler. The taps of these vessels were always slightly above the bottom, so that the sediment of the water should not pass into the cups. Ancient medicine attributed to water a singular curative virtue which it has also been supposed to possess in our days. This system, so much talked about now by some persons, is therefore not new. Hippocrates carefully distinguished the difference between good and bad water. The best, according to him, ought to be clear, light, inodorous, without any flavor, and drawn from springs exposed to the east. He interdicts all those which proceed from melted snow. Esclopiades made his patients drink plentifully of water, and frequently ordered them cold baths. The physician Musa prescribed to Augustus the same regimen, and the emperor found himself much benefited by it. Under the reign of Nero, Charmus acquired a great vogue by extolling cold baths even in the depth of winter. This dexterous native of Marseilles knew so well how to persuade people that he could hardly attend to his immense connection, and as he sometimes required as much as eight hundred pounds from his patients, he soon became as celebrated for his riches as for his pretended medical genius. Who will say after this that the water cure system is good for nothing? In Egypt rich people have the water brought to them from the Nile in leather pouches. Large and porous earthen pots of an oval shape kept up by supporters are filled with it. The water at the end of a few hours has deposited the slime it contained. It is afterwards distributed in small vases of terracotta called bardaks, of the size of our water jugs. These vases are taken in the most showy part of the habitation. In a short time the clay of the bardocks is impregnated, their surface is covered with water, which, after borrowing from the liquid within the caloric it requires for evaporation, reduces this to a temperature of six or seven degrees under that which it had before. Parmentier. More than five centuries ago the Sieur de Jeanville described the same process. 
The water of the Nile, he said, is of such a nature that when we hung it in white earthen pots made in the country to the rigging of our ships, the water became in the heat of the day as cold as spring water. Sea water is not potable, but it has long since been remarked that the vapors which rise from the sea are soft, and it was thence concluded that by collecting and condensing them it would be possible to obtain a potable liquid fit for domestic purposes. This phenomenon was known in the time of Pliny, who informs us that fleece spread about the ship after having received the exhalations from the sea becomes damp, and that fresh water may be extracted from it. About the middle of the last century, means were found to remove the saline substances from sea water. Boyle, Leibniz, the Count of Marsigli, all had made a great number of fruitless experiments. Mr. Poissonnier invented a very simple distillating machine, with which, and an absorbing powder, he succeeded in depriving sea water of its insufferable bitterness and rendering it perfectly salubrious. About 1784 a successful experiment was made at York with a machine which produced the same result. Some travelers have related that at the Iron Island the only soft water was that which was collected from a large tree in the center of the island and which was incessantly covered with clouds. The water ran continually from the leaves and fell into two large cisterns constructed at the foot of the tree, which according to Jackson furnished enough for 8,000 souls and 100,000 cattle. Let us see, said the Bory de St. Vincent, what amount of credit is due to the marvellous tree of the Iron Island. Abru Galindo, in his manuscript treatise on the Canary Islands, preserved in the archives of the country, said that he wished to see with his own eyes what the tree was. He embarked, arrived, took a guide to conduct him to a place called Tigulahe, which is separated from the sea by a valley, and there at the extreme boundary, under a large cliff, was the holy tree which in the country is called Garo. Its trunk is twelve spans in circumference, four feet in diameter, and nearly forty feet in height. The branches are wide apart and tufted. Its fruit resembles an acorn, and the kernel is, in color and taste, like the little aromatic almonds which pine nuts contain. It never loses its leaves, that is to say the old ones do not fall until the young ones are formed. On the north side are two large stone pillars of twenty square feet hollowed out to a depth of twenty spans. These pillars are so placed that the water falls into one and is preserved in the other. Vapors and mists rise almost every day from the sea, particularly in the morning, and at no great distance in the offing. These vapors are carried by the east wind against the cliffs which block their passage, so that they cover the tree, become condensed on its smooth leaves, and run off drop by drop. The more the east wind rains, the more abundant is the supply of water. It is distributed by a man who guards the tree. A whirlwind tore up the Garot in 1625. End of section 27. Recording by Philip Gould.